uh, it's now a really great pleasure to introduce a tr trio of minds coming together for the next session. Uh, it all really does start with Diana Reese because we got in touch with Diana's work, uh, with Diana uh, being admirers of her work with cetaceans and with elephants. Uh, it's an inspirational work uh, that uh, inserts notions such as affect and de-anthropomorphizing the viewpoint, implicit knowledge, uh, and so on, uh, in the uh, experience uh, and science of uh, working on interspecies communications. And Diana put us in touch with Peter Gabriel, uh, a man who needs no introduction, of course, but if we had to say two words, I would say a humanitarian, a musician, also responsible for an enormous amount of gatherings uh, between people, great people of different disciplines for, uh, for really, really fundamental causes, including Amnesty International's Human Rights Now Worldwide Tour in 1988, um, and co-founding several organizations, including Witness.org, a human rights organization, uh, and TheElders.org, which he um, uh, created with Richard Branson and Nelson Mandela. Um, the uh, third participant, part of this uh, puzzle is Vint Cerf, uh, again, someone who needs no introduction, uh, but for the sake of being up here, uh, one of the pioneers of the internet, uh, yeah, <laughs> one of the pioneers of the internet, and now working on the uh, interplanetary internet. But uh, Diana really uh, sort of brought this, uh, this uh, group uh, together uh, because of a project called the Interspecies Internet that I'm hoping that both Peter and Diana will tell us a little bit more about. Uh, and before we hear from Peter, uh, this is a message that Vint Cerf has sent us about the Interspecies Internet. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vint Cerf. I'm Google's chief internet evangelist, but today the topic is Interspecies Internet. The internet is simply a tool for allowing the possibility of non-human species interacting with each other across the network. It simply allows us to bring these species together that might otherwise not be co-located. So the internet part is actually incidental to what's very important, which is trying to understand what uh, the non-human brain is capable of understanding, is capable of uh, contemplating. Uh, like you, my colleagues and I are quite fascinated by the evolution of brains in uh, non-human species and also very curious to know uh, to how close they come uh, to the human capability to communicate, to recognize self, for example, for recognizing non-self, for uh, recognizing that uh, a screen, for example, uh, is in fact a medium of communication. So our interest is to try to explore what it is that these non-human species are capable of understanding. Anyone who has ever uh, owned a, a dog, for example, or a cat, uh, has uh, discovered the uh, remarkable ability of these animals to play, to, to, know, uh, to have fun, for example. And I think that takes a fairly significant degree of mentation. Uh, to say nothing of uh, discovery, for example, I mean, uh, you know, the old expression about curiosity in the cat. Well, cats really are very curious, and they're capable of doing some very unusual things. More recently, I read a book about uh, octopi or octopuses, uh, and uh, concerning their mostly brain and arms, uh, I've learned that they are actually capable of some pretty extraordinary um, thinking capable of doing things, uh, playing jokes, uh, squirting water at people that they don't like, uh, which might sound like it's a, uh, uh, an anthropomorphization, uh, but I don't think that's true. I think that these non-human brains are just as capable as human brains are of uh, coming to conclusions about what they like and they don't like, and they behave accordingly. So our interest here uh, is to understand to what extent a non-human species is capable of communicating either with a human, both locally and remotely, and then even more interestingly, uh, with another non-human species. So is it possible, for example, that a chimpanzee uh, could somehow communicate to a dolphin? Now, each of them will have different means for 
activating communication mechanisms. So the dolphin might use the you know, bottlenose to touch uh, a screen or a board or something like that, where the chimpanzee might sign uh, or, uh, or might uh, use the hands you know, to manipulate symbols uh, on, a, uh, on a board or even a screen. Uh, so our curiosity here is how far can we go to uh, allow these non-human species to communicate with each other. And in the course of exploring uh, this capability, uh, those of us like me who are interested in science fiction also imagine that this uh, exercise might even prepare us for the possibility of encountering uh, a non-terrestrial but intelligent species. Uh, and it's rather interesting to contemplate how on earth we would, well, perhaps that is not even the right term, you know, how, how uh, at all uh, would we establish any commonality in order to communicate? Uh, I'm sure that as you think about it, you know that uh, without some common experience, it's very, very difficult to communicate concepts uh, to, uh, to someone else or something else. So these are all part of the drivers for what you'll be hearing uh, in uh, the sessions today. And I'm sorry I can't be there with you. I really would have, would have liked to, but my calendar didn't cooperate. So in the meantime, perhaps we'll cross paths on the net. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Gabriel to the stage. It's uh, fantastic to hear and see some of this stuff. Um, I've found the attempts by non-humans to uh, master our language fascinating. And that led me to um, a wild call to Sue Savage Rumbo, who was at that time at the uh, Atlanta uh, Language Lab, Research Lab. And um, I'd said that I would be fascinated to have an opportunity to try playing a little music with some of the bonobos she was working with. And Sue, being the sort of person she is, said, come on down. And I had about five visits. So this was 2001, but um, I will show you uh, what, what we were doing. Thanks, Kamal. Question. Choose. Go. So, <coughs> these symbols are something that Sue devised Question. as an interface for communication yes. with her bonobo. So, yeah, the clever board was you the one that was connected. See, you want to go to the Pisque building and see Matata? No, you can't, you can't do that. We can do that on the weekend, maybe. But Kanzi's over there now. Uh-huh. Kanzi got to go over and see Matata, didn't he? This is Pambanisha. Yeah. Um, but you get to play. Kanzi doesn't get to play the piano. You get to play the piano. You would like some juice? Nancy is her brother. Well, you can have some juice. We can order you some juice. Oh, does Nathan want juice too? Nathan, sorry, Nathan. Okay, you do, Nathan? You want some juice? He wants juice too? Okay, well, we can have some juice. Maybe when Peter goes over to listen to Kanzi, we'll get our juice and we'll drink it then, okay? What, you want the, the child side juice kind of juice? Okay. So the child I'm next side door, kind of juice, the kind sitting in front of the side. keyboard. Well, and then we put this fine. keyboard uh, for Pam Benicia. Can you play a grooming song? Grooming song is. We asked her what subject she wanted to the song to be about. Yeah. Grooming. live improvisation. I'd asked if she could use single a single finger. She chose to use two.
like this note. She then found the octave. Press the good button. Good. She knew she'd done Council very well. Like to play. Do you think he'll do a good job? So now we're talking about Will Kenzie. Will he be nice when he's in here? Her brother. Not so sure. Now he's had a book so. written about him. He's called the uh, Ape of oh, Genius. Sue told Kenzie he had to be nice. Yes, Sue told him. He wasn't very happy that we'd started working me? with Pam Benicia with his sister. I'm not so sure he'll listen to me. He's uh, a little more yeah. of a of an well, artist. If not nice, maybe, maybe, maybe I should tell him to stay there. Shall we ask him if he's going to be good? Kanzi, are so you going to be good? I had some other musicians <laughs> down in the kitchen next door. So he comes in a, a bit like James Brown. Picks up his cloak. Discards it. No question about the rhythm. didn't like he didn't like the fact that uh, we were separated he wanted to be in the same physical space we were jamming in but unfortunately because of a few missing fingers the university didn't allow that but uh, <coughs> anyway that's primarily what I wanted to show you but I think it was I was just blown away and talking afterwards with Sue we started thinking about what other species might be able to connect and other ways of doing it. And we started a, a project then called ApeNet, which sort of evolved with Diana and Neil and Vint into interspecies internet. So you know, we're not trying to we do a lot of it. Diana is doing her work, but we really believe that we want a platform to facilitate and encourage and accelerate the communication between our species and other species before we destroy all the others. Thank you. Amazing and unbelievable. And I'm so glad I didn't get to see this video before now because now I'm unemotional, as I hope you all are, or assume. Uh, please welcome Diana Reese to the stage. Okay. Oops, going back. Here we are. Okay. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here, and uh, I'm thrilled to have heard all these terrific talks today. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here. This is one of my favorite topics. I'm really interested in interspecies communication. I've also worked with the SETI program for years. Um, many years ago, John Lilly, who um, was one of the first people to ever study dolphins and get scientists excited about big brains, um, went to SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and said, you know, you should really be thinking about other big brains that are on this planet. And he got people like Frank Drake, and uh, other folks who were working at SETI at that time, Carl Sagan, really excited, and they came up with something called the Order of the Dolphin. This was in the 60s. The idea was, let's use dolphins as a model to see how well we can understand the communication of animals quite different from us. And I didn't know about Lily doing that when I went to SETI, so I, was, I found it really exciting that other people had similar, we've had similar ideas about dolphins being great models for us to try to study the communication of animals that are quite different from us. 
And um, so here we have these non-terrestrials, not extraterrestrials, but these are animals that live in a totally marine environment. So they truly are non-terrestrials. So imagine living totally in a world of water, being non-handed, and experiencing buoyancy as opposed to experiencing gravity. Your movement unconstrained in all three dimensions. Seeing not only with vision, but with sound. Put out sound waves, echolocation clicks, getting acoustic images back about your world. Maybe even seeing internal body states of those around you. Staying connected with your friends, not by cell phone when you're at a distance, but by sounds that you produce, because sounds travel five times faster in water than they do in air, and they can stay connected in the depths of the ocean. And also, thinking, thinking about taking your next breath. These animals have to think to breathe, not, th not breathing reflexively like we do. And never not completely sleeping like we do, because one of their two hemispheres always stays conscious. They have to think to breathe. They have to be vigilant. So these are really animals that have evolved in quite a different environment than we have. These are societies in the seas. They are, have complex societies. It's called a fusion-fission society. It means they make friends. They make lots of alliances. They combine certain friendships in making cooperative alliances so they can accomplish lots of different tasks. And if we look at these dolphins when they're in the ocean, and I'll see if we're getting sound on this. Can we bring the sound up a bit? I want you to hear some of these sounds. Here they come emerging from the depths. These are some of the dolphins we study in the field in Belize. They're using sounds, they're using clicks, they're using also a cacophony of sounds, as well as body language, body movements, relationships to each other in space. We're trying to decode how do these animals communicate? How can we get into the communication system of animals where we don't have a Rosetta Stone? We really don't have a common ground having evolved in very different environments. My colleagues at Rockefeller University and I have been very fortunate to have some new tools we can use. And we're using aerial drones to be able to eavesdrop and spy on dolphins. It's like flying above them, being invisible. We want to be invisible. We don't want to disturb them to learn about their communication. And we can get new, I, we're looking through a new lens. We can really get new perspectives on their social organization and the sounds they use. Now, these animals, like us, have large, complex brains. Their brains are actually larger than ours. Ours weigh in at about 1,300 grams. Theirs are about 1,700 grams, but their bodies are larger than us. So we talk about body weight versus brain weight, and dolphins have the second largest brain to body ratio. We call it EQ, encephalization quotient, to humans. We have, our brains are seven times the size they need to be to run our bodies. Dolphins have the next largest brain compared to their body. And it's this beautiful brain, it's highly convoluted, you see all these folds. It's a way of packing lots of neurons into a brain. And interestingly, that not just dolphins, but other animals we share this planet with, have the same building blocks that make up their brain. The same building blocks, why do we think that our brain is so vastly different. Now, Charles Darwin talked about continuity of evolution, physical evolution, and we embrace that. At least most of us embrace it now. But how about continuity of cognition? And more and more scientists now are really asking this question. Are other animals doing anything like what we do? And as been, has been posed by Ted Chang and others, what if, we, if there was intelligence and we simply didn't know what to look for? We didn't recognize something because we're stuck at looking through our human lens. This is a real challenge for all of us. So we have these complex, large brains in the dolphin. We have this big, beautiful brain. And I want to talk a little bit about how we look because it's really what drives me. I want to understand this brain and find ways of getting them to partner with us. So despite these profound differences, they show striking similarities in many way, ways in their behavior, patterns that we do recognize. 
so different, yet familiar in many ways, and they may be doing things we can't recognize. I have to say that. They may be doing things we simply can't recognize at this point. So let's at least start off with something we can recognize. As I mentioned before, they have long-lasting relationships. They, they go back to their, either their mothers when they're separated, visit. They, keep, uh, they have their youngsters with them for at least four years. So there's this long period of so social enculturation, learning by observing what others do, how you act, what are the norms in your society. They show a high level of social awareness and empathy. So dolphins, elephants, great apes are known to actually show care in very high levels with others, not just, just not their own species, not just kin, but also other animals and other species. And we've heard many, many stories in ancient times about dolphins rescuing sailors who've, been, who've fallen overboard. But I have a stack of newspaper clippings about people that say they were rescued by dolphins. Do they really know what they're doing? I think they do, and I'll try to explain a little bit more why. So many years ago, my colleagues and I d showed that dolphins, like us and the great apes, show mere self-recognition. This is a very uh, high level of awareness that we used to think was uniquely human. I'll show you a little footage of that later on. They show cooperative behavior in foraging and child rearing, um, in even mating in some cases. Non-handed species use tools. Dolphins use sponges in certain parts of the world, in Australia, to protect their rostrums. That's the pointy part of their face from getting abrased, they only use these sponges when they're foraging in rough, sandy uh, substrates. And they're creative, and I'm gonna show you some examples of that. Not handed, but creative. So I wanna give you um, a little, I just wanna share my first close encounter of the aquatic kind uh, that I had. I started working with a dolphin named Circe, and uh, I named her that. She was the Greek enchant enchantress. And um, Circe, I had a, I had to, in, in, in exchange for working with Circe, it was a small uh, zoo mar, uh, marine lab in the south of France. They asked me to feed this, teach her how to eat fish. Now you might think, why do I have to teach a dolphin to eat fish? This is what they do. But they were feeding her really big mackerel that had been frozen and thawed. And I looked at this mackerel and I looked at her head size that was about this wide and I thought there's no way she's going to eat this big fish. So I started cutting them up into sections, heads, middles, and tails. Now Circe was had been taken from the wild. And I want to say that we should never take these animals from the wild. We need to get global protection from them, and we're doing a lot of work to get people to understand these animals need protection, leave them where they are, and let's protect them in their environment. But at the time, this was in the late 70s, there were some places that were still taking dolphins from the wild. We didn't know any better. We know better now. So Circe had come in, and she was about uh, five years old, and she didn't know how to eat frozen, defrosted fish. So I cut these sections up into three, and she was eating the heads, she was eating the middles, she spit out every tail. And I looked at the tail, and I saw that it had sort of a fin on it. I thought, maybe I should cut this fin off, it would go down easier. So basically, I had, she had trained me to cut the fish just the way she liked. Anyway, everything was going fine, and I was teaching Circe to station. I was asked to teach her to station when I put my hand in the water, stop where I am, I have a bucket of fish, and stay with me while I'm feeding you. So this all was going well. These are big brain, smart animals. She was learning, and I would, whenever she would stay with me, I would give her a fish, and if she swam away, because we didn't have a common language, I went, I moved away. So I backed up about five, maybe 10 feet, and I would stay there for between 10 and 15 seconds. It was a timeout. It was my only way of letting her know that she did something wrong in this context, and it was breaking the social context, and uh, the social contact, and also she couldn't get fish. And it worked, because very quickly, Circe learned, stay there when her hand, when she gives you the hand signal, stay. So this worked as a correction mechanism. Okay. So what happened? So I'm feeding Circe, everything's going fine, and one day by accident, I gave her an uncut tail. She looked up, up at me with this big eye, and she spit the fish out, and she made a beeline across the other side of the tank and just took a vertical position and stared at me <laughs> from across this other tank. And I thought, can, is this, can she possibly be giving me a time out? <laughs> And I tell this story and everybody gets it because it's a familiar pattern to us. But is she really doing this or am I being terribly anthropomorphic? 
what's going on here? So as a scientist, I can't report this because it's one case, and I, maybe I'm over-interpreting wildly. So I set it up as an experiment. I was very careful after the weeks after that to cut her fish perfectly, not make any mistakes. And as long as I gave her cut tails, she stayed with me. But then I gave her, I had three experimental sessions. I gave her an uncut tail. And the, of the three times, each time I did it, over the course of the next weeks, she went to the other side of the pool and stayed there and did this behavior. It was fascinating. And I was studying communication theory at the time, and it really exemplified the essence of communication to me. You have a social situation. You're interacting. You don't have a shared code. I think she saw a pattern that seemed to function in a particular way, and she was using it back. And when I made an error, there was something common. What it really meant to Cersei, I can't tell you. But there was a pattern that connected us and a pattern that matched. That was my first contact. That was the beginning of communication. And I knew if I looked to the dolphin, I would find a partner. And I had to let them inspire me and learn more about them and let them take the lead. It's a very different way of working animals, but I think it really pays off. A second experience I had early on in my career with dolphins is I had just gotten my first video camera. We were using beta. That's how long ago it was. And I took my camera out of, out of the container, and I looked at the dolphin pool that I was, where I was studying these dolphins. This is, I'm, ex I'm making an excuse for a really bad video here. And this is what I saw. This is Shiloh. This is a different dolphin. Watch what she's doing. She's blowing a ring of air and creating a beautiful torus and following it up to the surface. She went down again. Seconds later, blew another ring. Now look at her behavior around this ring. Notice this is a circle. We're talking about not only the circle in the mind of a fish, a circle in the mind of a dolphin. She's avoiding it. She's looking at it. She's aware of this circle. Next one. This is the next in the sequence. This is what I saw next. Uh, Shiloh blows a ring, follows it up, blows a second ring. It forms a hoop, and she swims through it. So this is a non-terrestrial, non-handed creative intelligence that I think has a sense of aesthetics. And when I say that, it's because we actually did a study not funded by any government agency. We weren't studying dolphin bubble ring play. But we published a paper back in the late 90s saying this is the first case we had for a non-human animal, because we're, yeah, we're animals as well, non-human animal to create their own objects of play. And we actually quantified the way they blew these bubble rings. So we could see when they blew one that was misshapen and not a perfect circle, they would watch and smack it with their tail and go back and blow another one until they were perfectly formed. They seemed to have a sense of form, a circle in the mind of this dolphin. Non-handed. Now, I'm at the National Aquarium as well as doing field work now. Here's another dolphin. She's two and a half years old. Her name's Bailey. She found another way to do this. The dolphins in this pool were blowing rings to play with. They have toys to play with that we make them. They created their own object. See if you can see what Bailey's doing. How's she making this one? If you notice, she's blowing air out of her blowhole. That's at the top of their head. That's their nostrils. And then, do you see what she's doing? Who sees what she's doing? How's she making it? She's hitting it with her tail flukes. So she blows it, and she figured if she smacks it, it makes a ring. She did this for 45 minutes, <laughs> creating these beautiful bubbles of air. And they seem to understand how to interact with them, because if they touch them with their rostrum, they break. So they actually spit water at them and can get them to move. And we've seen this occur in many different animals. It's gone viral on video. When we published our original paper, maybe four people read the paper, because it was before. <laughs> then. Anyway, I'm glad people appreciate this now. Now, I'm going to show you one more sequence. These are not strange crop circles. These are dolphins making rings off the coast of Florida. Again, our theme of rings. So we see one dolphin. This is from BBC, Ocean Giants. This is a dolphin kicking up the silty bottom. And she's making, or he, is making a beautiful ring and capturing fish. They can manipulate their environments. They're not using technology like we do. They're using their environment. These are non-handed. They're using their fluke. A ring is made. Fish are inside it. Not sure how the fish feel about this ring. But now you see her, the, the, the other dolphins racing in when the circle is completed. And they all share in the spoils of the fish. 
So cooperative behavior, understanding something about how to capture fish. Dolphins use many different foraging strategies. This is one among many. They d use different cooperative feeding strategies. <laughs> but they're quite aware of the timing on this. They have to come in when the circle is closed. So you'll see these rings up and down the coast. So I was thrilled when I heard that we were this conference was, be was being called the shape of a circle in the mind of a fish, and I thought, let's talk about the shape of a circle in the mind of a dolphin, because there does seem to be an appreciation of this form. And um, I, when I saw the film Arrival, and I had a wonderful conversation with Ted today, you know, it struck me that we have to look to them and try to find out what they're doing and letting that inform how we interact with them. We have to find some common ground. Without that, I don't think there's any hope of communication. So I spent a lot of my career just watching them before I did anything, trying to understand the nature of their signals. And we're trying to decode, and it's really hard. I think a lot of animals are better at reading our signals than we are at theirs. We're, getting, we're doing baby steps now. I want to talk about some approaches that we've used um, in f that have I think will help us get glimpses of the dolphin mind. And so far, we've had a few. So we know that we recognize our face in a mirror. It's, it seemed to be human, a uniquely human ability for many years. Um, we know that sometimes we can get a little obsessed with this, like Narcissus. But again, it's a rare ability thought to be uniquely human. Humans can do it. Then it was shown that our, our, our closest relatives, the great apes, from common chimpanzees to bonobos like Kanzi and Pambanisha that Peter talked about, to the orangutans to gorillas, all show this ability. Monkeys don't show it spontaneously. And here's, whoops, I don't know why we're flickering here, but here's a dolphin. This is Bailey again, the bubble blower. Looking through a one-way mirror, she's seeing a mirror, we're looking through a window. And she is watching herself spinning. This is a dolphin understanding that's herself in that exterior, in that exterior image. And it's very sophisticated. Not only do they understand it's themselves, but they use the mirror as a tool to watch themselves. They go to it. They do unusually in and interesting behaviors and many creative behaviors at the mirror. I wish I had more time. I would show you more videos. Um, we also showed that many years later, uh, Franz Duval and I showed it many years later uh, with elephants. Now, a long time ago, at, my, at the lab that I worked in in California that I started, we did another study, and this was paid by, it was supported by Barney Oliver, who was one of the people who had, had been an active scientist at SETI. He got engaged in the work, and we designed an underwater keyboard. We had lovely funding from Hewlett Packard, from Barney Oliver and the folks there. So this was a keyboard that was interfaced by, with fiber optic cables. We barely knew how to interact with them. We were struggling. How do you begin? But we, I took into the account their sensory systems. They use echolocation. They have good vision. They have a big optic nerve. They can touch objects. Other work had been done looking at visual discrimination abilities, and they have huge auditory processors. These are animals that have not only great auditory processing abilities, but they're vocal mimics. They learn vocally like we do, like birds do. So when the dolphins hit one of these keys, let's say they hit the H shape, they heard a particular whistle that was different than the whistles they would produce, and we would give them a belly rub or a tickle, depending on how they positioned their body. If they, and th these symbols move from minute to minute. So they didn't have to just learn position. They had to track a symbol if they wanted to get a specific contingency. The triangle got them a different sound, and it sounded like <laughs> And they got a ball. And a different symbol got them a ring, and then a disc and a float. So we were giving them choice and control. So what this keyboard allowed us to do is ask, what if we give these really big brain dolphins choice and control? Very few people were doing it at the time, and it seemed to be a natural thing. Get them involved. See what they do if we relinquish control. How will they use a system? So here's a little piece of footage from BBC, but from PBS Nature. There's no sound on this one, but this is Delphi and Pan, the two males that were born in our facility. Their moms were in the pool as well. And they would be pushing the keys. This is one of my research assistants, Laura. If they push a key, we hear the sound. In English, they hear and they get an object. So they're able to request different things. And they can stay and play with us with it. They're pretty cute, I have to say, right? And they could play with us with the object. They could play by themselves. Often they chose to play with us. But if you take a look at Delphi over here, 
He's a pretty big dribbler. This was one of his big games. <laughs> it was up to them. So what was really exciting was not only did they use the keys to get these things that just had to hit a key, they very quickly started to imitate the sounds they heard. Here's a computer ring, and that's the dolphin producing it. Beautiful rendition, great fidelity, and did it only after they heard this signal nine times. We didn't have to train it, it was spontaneous. Like when your children hear a word like pasta for the first time and they say pasta, it was that good. And it was on their terms, they controlled when they heard the sounds, they controlled what they got. Okay, I don't have time to talk about this in more detail, but when we think about language, I'm not claiming they have language and we never did. We talked about that they had learned these associations between objects, the sounds, and the keys. So when they would use the keyboard, Sometimes they would come up and they'd whistle ball and then hit the ball key and then they would get it. Sometimes while they were playing with balls, they'd be whistling ball. They weren't whistling ring, they weren't whistling rub, they only whistled ball. When they were, playing, when they were whistling ring, it was either before they hit a ring key or when they were playing with a ring. Here's a case in the upper sonogram. These are sound pictures, sonogram, and it's frequency on the vertical, time from left to right in the horizontal. That W means tickle. That's what they get if they hit the key. So this is the dolphin pan, hit rub, and he puts his contact call, that's that rising call, after it. Dolphins, like parrots and other animals, have their own identity calls, like we saw with the parrots. So he would hit rub and whistle and roll over for a rub. But the bottom image is not the computer. He bypassed the computer, and now he's whistling rub and his contact and rolling over. So they started to use this in the end of the first year and beginning of the second year without even the keyboard. But we, were, we didn't have the capability of tracking at that time, okay? Now, last thing I want to mention about this is that in the second year of a two-year study, we found that they started combining the signals. And we couldn't reinforce it because we didn't know when they were doing it until afterwards. We analyzed all this by computer. It's all videotaped, we record audio. And if the dolphin hit a ring key and then hit a ball key, there was always a half a second of silence between the two, so they never heard them together. Yet, here's ring, here's ball. And the, uh, the really fun story is that Jill Tarter, who was working with SETI, who was a close friend and colleague of mine, was the one who actually saw this. So she's out at SETI looking for signals, and she was sitting next to me at the computer, and she said, that looks like ring, that looks like ball. And it was really quite interesting because you might say, well, when are they using it? They had invented a new game when we got this. They started this game where they would hit for ball, and, or then they, he would, they would hit for ring. Again, they never heard the sounds uh, put together. And when they were playing this double toy game is when we got these calls in the pool. And we had them not once, not twice, but 28 or so times during the course of the second year. So what that means, we're not sure. It may give us a clue into, the into how to decode their system. And we're interested in whether their own calls are uh, combinatorial. Some animals have shown combinatoriality, like little chickadees use combinatorial calls. We were very limited by the technology. This was, we started this study in 1983. I feel like I'm really getting older when I talk about this. And we could barely do it. And for, since then, I've been wanting to come up with better technology to really propel us forward. And I met my wonderful colleague, Marcelo Magnasco, who's a biophysicist and head of the Integrative Neuro uh, Lab at Rockefeller. We teamed up and we developed this underwater touchscreen. So what we, what we have now is a four by eight foot touch pad for dolphins, or touch screen for dolphins. It had to be dolphin safe because we're really concerned with their welfare. It's an interactive system for giving them more choice and control in a more sophisticated way. And it detects their touches, not like where our touches are detected when we touch a touch screen, but optically. So there's a camera behind it that detects their touches to the touch screen. So we're at the National Aquarium. This is where our lab is now. Again, we do field work as well as work at the aquarium. And I'm really proud to say that National Aquarium uh, is building the first dolphin sanctuary. So in the next three years, all these dolphins will be moved to much more naturalistic environment. We're hoping to take the touch screen with us. I've been working on this project since its inception. We think we can do better in terms of a new kind of environment. And we're hoping to create a new vision for the future of how we may house dolphins. We're looking for more partners as well. Um, we just got a very nice uh, 
a round of support from Richard Bar Branson also, so we're quite grateful to that. So this touch screen is where the arrow is under an overhang. Here's a picture from a dolphin point of view. It's a four by eight foot screen and it shows visual forms. And we have cameras mounted above so we can track the dolphins visually and we're trying to track them acoustically as well. So we can see when they're coming to this area and the touch screen is right under here. So here's a picture of what the touch screen w may look like. We're making some alterations now. So if the dolphin, for example, touches a symbol, like we did before, they'd see a picture of a ball and get a ball in their pool. So they see it, hear it, and get the, the ball. We actually created, get ready for this, dolphin apps. So they're not out there on the market, so we created some things that are kind of like whack a fish and what we did is we wanted to see would we, would we engage them in this kind of interactivity, non-technological animals. They've never seen a video screen. They've never had technology. They were born in, in captivity in the aquarium. So we did a, a variety of apps, and if they hit a key for it, they can turn it on, but we have to connect the dots. How do they even understand how to make a request, how to ask? We designed, and this is really appropriate for the Serpentine Gallery, a drawing app. And I wanted to see what would happen if they could move on a screen, if they hit their ross, if they touch the screen with their rostrum or a part of their body, they can actually make an image. And these colors on here are colors that dolphins can see. They don't see the same colors we see. So we're adjusting this to their color vision. What will they do if they learn that they can make movement on a screen? These get saved as JPEGs. Maybe we'll have a showing. Lucia, any chance we can get this? Okay, dolphin art. Um, so now, in closing, I just want to mention that we created, we had to calibrate the system, we tested it with human divers, we had to do dolphin rostrum prints rather than human thumbprints to see would the optical camera register their rostrum. It was very time consuming to do this. Um, but what we found was we gave them a test. Would they touch and engage with uh, whack-a-mole? So you're going to see in the upper part, this is it, first time, this is Foster, he's seven years old, he gets the whack-a-mole game. The bottom is showing you a, the, where he's touching. You see the cursor on the bottom, the little dot? That's where he's touching. He hit every fish. This is an animal, non-technological. He's hitting every fish with the exception of one and getting just right on target. So it's telling us a lot about their sensory system. They can see with their eye and come in and touch it with their melon. The second time we gave it to him in another session, he started touching with his rostrum, first time with his melon. He was engaged. We were really surprised. We didn't realize how quickly these animals would be engaged with the technology. So, <laughs> the, yeah, this is a salute, obviously. And what's so exciting to me as a scientist is that it's open-ended. It's asking them to lead the way. And hopefully this will help us with our decoding project it's going to be really exciting to see what they do with choice and control. And this is exemplary of what Peter and Vin and Neil and I are trying to do with the interspecies internet. We're trying to find methods of giving these animals voices because they're not, they can't speak to us if we don't understand them. And I think by using these cognitive tools, they're probably one of our strongest conservation and animal welfare tools. These animals need our protection. We're trying to give them a voice and um, hopefully we'll have more to share in the future. Thank you. Does so anybody, I think we have a microphone out in the audience. Uh, plan B. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about this adventure that we're engaged in? About the interspecies internet or any of things either one of us have said? If not, we can bring more people up. Well, if the, the dream is just to create a platform, but anyone doing interesting work or um, that wants to try anything, really, in terms of giving non-humans choice and control, which are Diana's key words, would, would have a means of then uh, connecting. So um, Neil Gershenfeld is at MIT. He runs a, runs a wonderful thing called the Center for Bits and Atoms. but he also has a huge access to a huge server, which he's created. So that's going to be the, the sort of the means through which a lot of this communication happens at first. But I'm sure it will be able to be 
used on the internet. So I think we're just trying to encourage anyone and any one of you that uh, are involved and interested in in these interfaces that might allow us um, to to understand and and give them a means of communicating. So so for for example, I mean one issue which is going to come up is we have a friend Mary Lou Jepson who's designing um, what we believe will supersede the MRI scanner, and it's <clears throat> um, for one thousandth the price of an MRI. Um, and a million times the resolution using infrared light and holography um, going to produce this consumer electronics item. Now, if some of these non-human intelligences choose to volunteer, because we would certainly not do it under any other circumstances, then we have means of seeing their thoughts. If it's in uh, Berkeley, they've got some experiments which <coughs> where they've analyzed people in an MRI scanner looking at video. And every frame of video, they um, connect, uh, the computer registers the brain pattern for each frame of video. Uh, so what it's starting to do when you switch the video off and ask people to think of something and then bring up the images which were present when that brain pattern was last there, um, you're starting to get a way into people's thoughts. That's going to change the way we interact, the way we live, but also gives us enormous potential for understanding the thoughts of uh, non-humans. But as I said, it requires on them choosing to participate. So I just want to add something to that. So for example, real quickly, so in, in, when we, in cognitive studies with humans, you can show someone something like this glass, and through imaging, in, in normal imaging, you can show that the occipital area, the, the visual center of the brain, is active. Then you can have someone close their eyes where there's no external output and say, okay, think of that image, and you'll see the same areas active. You know, So there's all sorts of imagery. It's not just visual, there's acoustic imagery. And this is what Peter, I think, is talking about, is there's more sophistication in some of the technology now. We can, but if it can an animal, does an animal have imagery? They have memories. Um, and it gets us into the, some of the areas that they might be using. So, yeah. what does anyone, mean sorry, interested in that? It's Mary Lou Jepsen, J E P S E N, and Open Water is is the project. But but I think it will relate to all of this. So, what does a, an interspecies server look like? I very much I think like another server. <laughs> this, but I, I don't. I mean, I th I think we just. Um, I mean, this is more a question for Neil than for me, but I, I think uh, it's just a big um, uh, Google Hangout, basically. But but it has. I, th I think Neil has devised a few cus customized ways of connecting. So uh, I don't know. I mean, he's using it for Fab Labs at the moment, which is another very interesting project. But um, it's going to be made available. Uh, you know, we're still at the stage of of um, working with interfaces and trying to see how it would work. But I think any variations from what people need would be uh, what Neil would then build into the system. Um, so he has this conferencing technology so you can plug into different labs. So imagine, and this is not far from a reality for us, we want to study dolphins and we want to see how they communicate. So how do we do that? Well, what if we Skyped with dolphins? What if we let them Skype? And what I mean is, they have two, there's a touch screen in one pool, there's a touch screen at a remote facility, let's say in Paris, because we have interest. And if you connect two groups of dolphins, just acoustically and visually in real time, and there's, we have the bandwidth to do it, what kind of signals would they use? What kinds of interactions? As scientists, it's very exciting to ask those kinds of questions. And we could also see when you give them choices again, it's their choice. They can shut it off with a button, because if you want to give animals choice and control, they should be able to shut things down. But would they be more interested in looking at dolphins of their own species? Are they interested in looking at pilot whales? Are they interested in looking at chimps? What kind of interactions? It's allowing them to show us some of their choices. So it's quite interesting as You're a tool. Allowing us to open up ourselves as well to understanding different ways of us opening up to them 
because actually th this is a sort of superior view of looking at things. I mean, science is often, I'm a scientist, this is often a way of us being superior and questioning in the way that we can question. Don't we have to open up to different ways of them as we, you know, I mean, that's almost pejorative saying them, yeah. looking at us and communicating with us and us opening up to them being I, able I, to communicate with us? I would say it's fundamental. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, I made five visits f to the bonobos and I learned soon that, you know, you had to create the space. You had to get out of the way and create the space for them to, to lead. You know, so I was trying to follow uh, what Pam Benicia particularly was playing. I mean, w once we had the band, it was a different situation with Kanzi. But, but she, was, she was sort of leading the harmonies and I was trying to follow behind. And, and I think, uh, yeah, you'd said about listening and I think that's the key word and, and making the space, which, you know, I think is fundamental uh, to our education as well. Uh, and, and, yeah. Is with more than just our ears. Exactly. I, I, that's okay. We, I just want to make a note that there's a, there's a, a Con, Conrad Lorenz, I'm slightly jet lagged, sorry. Conrad Lorenz, who's a famous ethologist, talked about King Solomon's ring. It's a biblical story that King Solomon had this magic ring, really apropos for the circle. The, our theme of the circle, that King Solomon had a magic ring, uh, this is a tale in the Bible, and he was able to communicate with animals. And Conrad Lorenz, the ethologist, suggested maybe it wasn't really a ring, but it was the power of observation, or hearing, or watching. And I think that many of our, my colleagues who study animals, and, and Peter in, in his approaches with music, we're letting them take the lead, we're watching, we want to learn from them, and then incorporate that, find that common ground, I think it's critical. Am, am I up? Yep. Excellent. Ouch. Diana, you uh, showed us how uh, you can give dolphins control over the toys that they have, and you've sort of implied also that uh, this kind of technology taken to the next level could allow them to even communicate to us about uh, potential hazardous changes to their environment. Um, I'm curious whether you've tried to give them control over their environment and the habitats they have. Have you created like a dolphin thermostat or yeah that's that's a really cool idea and i think it's something that it's been very difficult to do in dolphin facilities i mean we've made facilities and zoos much more naturalistic looking in the past dolphin facilities have stayed fairly sterile not because of any uh reason other than it's better husbandry. If you try to put a natural environment in there and give them too much leeway, they may not make the right choices. In this case, if in natural environments were tried in dolphin facilities, and it's very difficult to keep it filtered and keep it clean. So there have been some issues. It's one of the reasons we're trying to move into a more natural environment, but giving them choice when they're there and finding ways that maybe choices that they're interested in, not in choices that we think they're interested in. And that's the challenge. But uh, Kanzi and Pam Benicia were allowed to choose their video entertainment. And uh, there was a program called Harry and the Hendersons in America about a Bigfoot uh, which lived with a family. That was one of their favorites. And the other one, somewhat predictably, was Planet of the Apes. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's... Should we bring everybody up? I just yeah. wanted to ask one question. I, was just say... uh, I wanted to ask... Oh, Philippe, I just wanted to ask one question about conservation um, in the future, perhaps influencing migratory routes, telling the dolphins not to swim too near Taiji. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. This is, what you're referring to is where dolphins are herded into the cove. It was a award-winning film, The Cove. Um, and yeah, there are places on this planet like in Taiji where unfortunately dolphins are still being slaughtered and uh, we need to stop it. So it's very hard to communicate to a dolphin, avoid this area. Um, there, it, people have tried and it's been quite difficult and they're unsuspecting. So it's up to us to make it safer for them. But thank you for bringing that up. 